we welcome you to this webinar, Getting Student Attention When Teaching Remotely. And this webinar is number, webinar number two in the series of four of the CARE Teaching and Learning Certificate Program. Just a reminder for those of you who were on the previous webinar or those of you who wanna move forward, if you attend all four webinars or if you watch the recordings, you can earn a micro-credential on innovative remote teaching practices with civic mindedness. You have just a really short little assignment if you wanna earn the micro-credential so that we can see the application of learning um, and then you can earn that micro-credential. We'll talk about it um, at the end. And our webinar today, it comes as a result of a program with the Library of Congress, um, Teaching with Primary Sources, and a partnership between DePaul University the Our American Voice program, and which also sponsors the Citizen U program. So today we're gonna to focus on four key ob objectives. We're gonna look at the role of the instructor when you're teaching remotely. We're gonna show you a framework so that you can have all, get all student attention during a learning situation, regardless of access, regardless of challenges a student may have, um, regardless of what you're teaching. We're going to look at strategies to both teach synchronously and asynchronously, and then we're going to give you some examples using a Citizen U lesson of how you can get students' attention. By the way, if you're interested in any Citizen U lessons, you can download them for free at citizen-u.org website that's got a myriad of lessons of how to integrate civics, civics across all disciplines um, for most grade levels. As we start today, I'd say make sure that you've got a pen and a notebook because you're going to want to take some notes. And as I pause here, I want to share with you two strategies that I just did to get students' attention. One is when you're doing a synchronous session with your students to make sure you greet every single one of them. Um, when I teach, and I'm uh, when I teach my graduate classes at DePaul, um, feels like 100 years ago now. Um, I usually stand at the door and shake every single student's hand. Um, I used to do that when I was a secondary teacher. When I was principal, I stood at the front doors of the building, and when we had 800 students, I had hand sanitizer on me all the time um, and had more sweaty hands than anything. But it's important that you greet each student. That's the first way to have students want to come back. The other part is to always ask your students to take notes. So when we're teaching face-to-face, -face, and if we're teaching elementary and even high school, sometimes we want all the students' attention on us, and we may not want them doodling or drawing, but now we really do want them to do that. So what you really want to do is encourage your students to whatever's happening, draw pictures, doodle, make diagrams, whatever they want, you want to encourage them to have another medium besides technology. It's also a way for them to not get um, technology fatigue um, if they can write alongside. So as we start today, this is a mood meter. So the mood meter was actually uh, created out of Yale University's Center for Emotional Intelligence. Great um, center if you ever need some tools and resources. What I'd like you to do in the chat is pick a color of where you think you are. So if you have students who maybe cannot articulate how they feel or where articulating how they feel may be very difficult just to hear, all you have to do when you check in with them to grab their attention, to show that you care is to say, okay, we're gonna pull out the mood meter, tell me your color today. So please in the chat box, just put your color. And what we're hoping for are those folks that are in the green and the yellow area, those are the so colors most associated with kind of being okay. But it's absolutely great if somebody's in the red area or the blue area. Um, I tend to be in a wheel today that goes from area to area. I think I've hit every color um, by one o'clock today. So as I mentioned, you want to grab a journal and you want your students to grab a journal. One of the very first tools that I wanna give you to grab students' attention is something that has been termed bullet journaling. You could put in the chat if you've ever heard of bullet journaling, but bullet journaling combines our right and our left brain. And it's a great technique for you right now and for your students as they are listening to you if you're doing a synchronous session or even if you're doing an asynchronous session to grab their attention. Bullet journaling means you write whatever thought you're having in your head and you draw a picture. If you feel like drawing a picture, you doodle, you put stars, 
there is a great deal of research around the positive impact of doing some left brain artistic work as you're doing right brain learning work. So having um, a bullet journal is really important. I do bullet journaling all throughout the day myself. I really think it's shifted my entire life. There are lots of folks um, that are very um, obsessive about their bullet journal. I'm one of them, but you can, there's all kinds of washi tape for bullet journaling. There's, um, and it's really just a simple thing. It's that you constantly write down how you're feeling, thinking ideas. I think someday these bullet journals or the journals that we have will become those important artifacts that may end up in the Library of Congress. If we look now to artifacts from the Library of Congress, those that grab, I know my students' attention are things like a handwritten note from Abraham Lincoln or, or those things, a, a little drawing from Einstein. Those are really significant and meaningful things. We need to sometimes move away from our technology where everything's in the cloud and everything will have to, some poor historian's gonna have to sort through the cloud and go back to that process that really is innate to the human body of drawing. So that's one of the first ways to grab your students' attention. A little bit about me. So I'm Donna Keel from DePaul University. I'm a uh, professor in our educational leadership program and in our teacher preparation program. I also um, founded our Office of Innovative Professional Learning, which is the professional de development arm of uh, the College of Education. And I have the real privilege of being a partner with the Our American Voice program and our two presenters with me today. Um, my research areas tend to be in emotional intelligence, social emotional competencies and learning and the neuroscience of emotion, but most importantly too around competency-based and engaged learning. I've been teaching online um, and remotely, had remote teaching practices ever since 2003. Um, when I started a, one of the first one-to-one -one laptop programs in the school where I was principal. I became principal in October, which is kind of a funny story, I could say for later, um, but started the one-to-one -one program in January. I tend to like to do things pretty rapidly. Joining me today is my esteemed colleague and one of the many brains behind this organization, John Fontanetta. John, you want to talk about yourself? Hi, everybody. Uh, yes, I am John Fontanetta. Uh, I am uh, an adjunct faculty member with DePaul now, and uh, I'm also the program director for the Our American Voice uh, Civics Education Program. Um, formerly, I was in, uh, a middle school teacher, a social studies teacher for many years in both uh, Chicago Archdiocese Catholic Schools and um, the public school district in uh, District 100 South Berwyn. Um, where I was also a, a middle school assistant principal at Heritage Middle School. And then uh, finally, I was uh, uh, principal of uh, Piper Elementary School in District 100. Uh, and uh, while I was principal in, in District 100, uh, my school became the first school to go one-to-one uh, -one, uh, learning from kindergarten through sixth grade. And uh, that was 24-7, so our students got to take their devices home at that time. So uh, we were very blessed with that. And uh, we went through an, uh, a very arduous process in order to uh, learn how to get that to work. So glad to see you all. Thanks, John. And also joining us today is um, Susie Evans, one of the other masterminds behind this program. Susie, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure will. Hi, and thanks for joining us today. I am also a former elementary teacher as well as special education. And as has been noted, um, a longtime member of the Our American Voice group here. I also, do, I am a professional learning facilitator for Lexia Learning. So I do a lot of remote learning as well as on site throughout the country. And I've also been an adjunct professor for various universities having to do with reading and math. And that's about it, Donna. Thanks, Susie. So glad to have you both here. Um, and Susie and John may be throwing in some suggestions that they have and know that we worked on this collaboratively. Um, but we really do hope to provide you with very practical tools, something that uses your time efficiently, but also tools where you can start using them tomorrow with your students or even if you're going to meet students later today. When I was a 
a teacher and if the principal sent me to a professional development session where I couldn't use something right away, truly I would end up making my grocery lists or doing other kind of reading. And we don't want that to happen here. We wanna give you some practical and meaningful information. So let's talk about how we get students' attention. So as I said, I teach in the pre-service program um, as well as in our ed leadership program. And part of the problem is we look at trying to get student attention by something we have to grab. And instead, what we really need to look at is what's getting in, what is the interference in general in anyone attending to what we might be doing or what we are being called to do. And the number one interference in attention is stress. So if you've got students right now who aren't paying attention much to your work, to your, the homework you're assigning, they have a really great reason. There's a layer of stress that we never have been through before and that kids are taking in a whole different way. We're doing some research right now, myself and some other professors around the student response to this stress because it's unlike any other kind of trauma that we've seen. The second thing is the environment. So imagine your students are in an environment where everybody's home. It could be a little bit stressful. And we're at the point now, because we're in week five, where we may not like each other anymore as much as we did in week one, two, or three, where we thought, oh, this is great. I get to hang out with the family, and not so much anymore. Um, so especially for kids, when they miss their friends and they miss routine and structure, and they have parents who are also uh, have a layer of stress. I did a parent workshop last evening around stress reduction, and I was amazed out of the parents, 100% of them said they're not sleeping at night. Um, they have all these signs and symptoms of trauma and fatigue. They're short tempered, they can't think straight. So you know that if that's happening, they're taking that out on um, their, their kids, they're just humans. The third reason is physical well-being. If you're tired, if you're hyper, we know that from the face-to-face -face class. Fourth, and this is where we tend to focus, is boring content. If your content isn't engaging, and if your content isn't meaningful or re relevant, which we'll talk about in a bit, it's really hard for students to pay attention. And then fifth, of course, is learning challenges and those things of access. And these are actually in order of significance. When we look at learning challenges, and those of you who are special ed, Susie especially, we we tend to think that those are the top reason why kids don't attend, but they, it's emotion. We are, dri we are driven to learning by from to you know, Vygotsky to um, Dewey would tell us that it really is more about a motivation and then about a cognition. And then finally is technology tools. The, and access to technology, while important, isn't the primary reason why students might not be engaged. So here's step one. We need to change our mode. We need to change from teacher-centered instruction to student-centered instruction. And there's a great deal of research around what student-centered instruction looks like. And in the classroom, it's really about autonomy and about decision-making. And in a remote setting, we have the perfect opportunity to have our instruction be far more student-centered. Typically, in teacher-centered instruction, we're the center of the knowledge. We held all the, all the keys. We transmit it from ourselves to our students. Students are those passive receivers who then have to prove to us that they know the pearls of wisdom we've taught them. However, that's the lowest level of learning. Teacher-centered learning is for sure the most disconnected and the lowest level. The reality is, and there's a great example of this um, in China where th their instruction, because their class sizes are 45 to 50, for um, a great deal, of long, uh, great deal of time was always teacher-centered. They discovered teacher-centered learning while they could do um, standardized tests efficiently and expertly, they had no creativity, no critical thinking, and the knowledge was often lost. And so they've switched and have spent a lot of money now to do more student-centered learning. In student-centered learning, um, it, also known as learner-centered education, we shift our focus from us to the student, where the student is the driver of the learning, where the student's interests and what they want to learn and their voice is far more important than our voice. The challenge to this in many districts, and I know this having been a principal, is that we are standard driven. And so we often tell our teachers, you've got to teach to the standard. 
I know that most districts, including CPS right now, the greatest thing has happened because we've been told we can drop the standards. I wanted to do a happy dance when I heard that because I wish we would have dropped them a long time ago. But if we have the wonderful opportunity to move a bit away from the standards, we can then shift to student-centered learning. And I wanna give you seven key strategies. First thing you need to do, and you can do this tomorrow, is give your students choice and autonomy over what they're learning. You can begin with, and in future webinars, hopefully we'll do some on problem-centered learning and um, on Genius Hour, you can begin with an essential question, uh, which is really simple to do, around what's a problem they wanna solve today. Simple, focus it within your discipline. How does math relate to that? How does social studies relate to that? How does English relate to that? Use open-ended questioning techniques, those things of inquiry where you're encouraging critical and creative thinking. Use inquiry-based instruction and encourage collaboration. The hardest thing when we're remote teaching is if we think we're remote teaching for students one-on-one. -on -one. We want to encourage group work. We want to encourage whatever way students can to talk to each other. I work with a school, uh, CPS school on the southeast side of the city, and one thing that we've, um, in order to work with the students who have limited tech access to technology, is we created groups using texting. And so students are using texting and FaceTime in order to work together. And it's been one of the most vibrant learning experiences. Students have said, I hope we don't ever go back on learning more this way, which I find fascinating. Fifth, allow always for students to talk about their learning. So it's about the process, not the product. If you can switch one thing today, think about learning with your students instead of they know this content, they know how to think about this content. So think about the process of learning rather than the product of learning. Let there be self-pacing in some of your assignments, which is not intuitive to us as teachers. We like deadlines, but allow for students to move at their pace. And rather than having them complete a worksheet by a certain deadline, have them complete a, a video of themselves using their phone, talking to you about how they're learning. You will get so much more assessment data from that than them completing a worksheet. Get students involved in community-based activities. And what you'll find in our Citizen U lessons that are free for you up online is that many of them, all of them, are civic action focused and they lead students right to community-based activities where they can become those responsible citizens who change our world. Here's what happens. If you can do these roles, if you can shift from teacher-centered learning to student-centered learning, you change to become a coach, a mentor, you are still are the content expert, that's okay, but you become the designer of your course and a facilitator, and most importantly, a storyteller. If any of you follow or have read the work of Joseph Campbell or have looked at some of the most recent research around the power of story and storyboarding, we know that story from ancient times has been the deepest way for us to transform learning in someone else. It's by telling a story that we can really deeply learn something. That's what students always want to hear from you, but that's what you want to hear from them. So one way to start your synchronous remote teaching is to ask one or two students to give you a two to three minute story of something that they learned or something that they found interesting. Have them connect it to your content area that you might be studying and then have them connect it to a problem they want to solve. So if they tell you a really interesting story about how their dog ate all the bread that mom baked, which kids find very interesting and because everybody for some reason is obsessed with baking sourdough bread now, you can say, okay, so how many loaves, let's connect it to math. Now what's the problem that you want to solve? What's going on? And they'll come to, like a, a little third grader did yesterday when we were uh, trying this out, They'll come to, you know, I really want to solve the problem of my daddy getting a job so he'll get out of the house. And so he started to look at ways that, that somehow within his father's field, he could solve that problem. Pretty powerful. Here's what we know. When we sh shift to, to student-centered learning, we know that we are creating meaning. We're doing everything that really matters in learning because these are the principles of learning that you learn that many of you, when you were becoming teachers and your pre-service teacher, program learned in learning theory. Learning has to be meaning-centered, language-based, human connection through relationship and social. When all of those components interact, we have learning. And if we remind, and this is a little bit of a reminder from those programs, 
learning happens in a sequence of first we grab attention, then we encode information, we store information, and then we retrieve it. If we look at how we grab students' attention, there's some great research by Schlechty. Actually, I used Schlechty a lot in my own dissertation. There are five levels of engagement. There's high attention, high motivation, high attention, um, and low motivation, and low commitment, low attention, and low commitment, no attention, and no commitment, and diverted attention, and no commitment. What we find often is that our students are in the last two areas, no attention, no commitment, and diverted attention and no commitment. We wanna bring them up to the higher areas. And the way that we do that is through looking at how we grab their attention and how we get them to encode information, store information and retrieve it because it's the encoding, the storage and the retrieval that's the commitment. But first we have to get the attention. And so as we said, there, we need to make learning that's meaningful and valuable that has attention in many forms. So I wanna focus on this attention in many forms and cite for you how that really helps. What we really wanna do is give students choice so they have ownership, they're empowered, and there's deeper learning. It's also the way to form students who become citizens, who are active and who are committed to change in a positive way. There's a great deal of research done by two very famous researchers in remote learning, online learning, and they looked at situations of remote learning when students were successful and they said what was happening and why were those students successful and it happened around the time that MOOCs were really popular if you remember um, MOOCs as you know free ways that people could learn and then they looked at one-to-one -one programs I came upon this research when my uh, high school was being studied um, as to why were we so successful and why was it that these underprivileged kids who had who 30% of my population with special needs and who were from poor areas and who could not get over a 16 on the ACT to save their lives. How come all of a sudden they were getting high scores on the ACT and all of a sudden their grades were going up? And what we found was that when we switched to remote learning that had four key components, reading, reflecting, displaying, and doing, um, that learning happened at a deeper level. The researchers coined that R2D2 so that teachers could remember it. I think it's a brilliant way. I'm gonna break it down for you. When you're designing your remote teaching, the read really means those who are visual, auditory, and verbal learners. And the R2D2 really means that what we wanna do is hit every kind of learning modality and every kind of learning style. Some of us are visual learners. Some of us are auditory learners. Some of you right now, this is driving you crazy because you'd rather see pictures and you can't stand listening, which is absolutely fine. So what Boink and Zhang found is that first, you have to make sure that you've hit all those modalities with some kind of way to get knowledge. You can use podcasts, PDFs, audio files, but you wanna make sure that you transfer that knowledge in every modality. Then in the reflection area, you wanna give students the opportunity those people who are reflective learners and observational learners to do some reflection on the knowledge before you do anything else. You give them portfolios or writing tools, self-testing tools, or have them create videos. Then if we look at visual learners, those are the ones who right now you're doodling away in your journal. You're drawing pictures and diagrams and you're creating things that are graphs and charts. You have a bunch of students like that. Giving students the chance when you've given them content from math all the way to English to say, draw me a representation of what you think this means helps those visual learners. And then finally you do the do part, which for us, I wanna show you, um, this is a sample lesson from Citizen U and it's on civil rights and civic action. This lesson goes through all of the elements of R2D2. The read takes you to the Library of Congress and in that Library of Congress, there's a collection for youth in the civil rights movement, which is, is, is a short essay for students to read. There's also pictures associated. There's this picture that allows students to reflect. So if you go to that Citizen U lesson, you have the R2D2 model all built together. So the students look at this picture when they're talking about youth and civil rights. They then use the primary source analysis tool, which you can find with that URL. And they look at the picture and complete, I see, I think, I wonder. Here's the thing. You allow 
helping students also in the reflection tool come up with questions you'd ask those folks back then or come up with questions of what this means for someone now whatever questions students have let them have autonomy and let them have voice in what they're learning and in the display tool, you'll see in the Citizen U lesson, we give teachers in the teacher guide, the guidance to create, have students create a concept map. So they're creating a concept map of how they might solve the problems of civil unrest, how they would solve the problems that they wanted to fix as a young person today. Our young people are far wiser than we ever give them credit for believe in them because they have ideas that can change the world. The lesson that we did with some middle schoolers um, last week focused on Anne Frank and kids came up and said, you know, she was a genius and no one was listening to her. And I thought, you know, you're probably right. And here's a, a sample of a concept map. And then the final thing you can have students create a civil conversation challenge so that students can then videotape themselves with their friends or they can record a conversation with their friends on their phone. Um, and this might be for older students, but in the Citizen U website, there's also lessons for younger students. The difference between what I just showed you and what you're used to, maybe, is traditional instruction has the student as the receiver in what this would be, which is more problem-based and more engaging, you have the student as the discoverer of the information. The greatest thing is that this type of learning modality of getting students' attention, it gives you assessments that are really easy because you can still do your exit slips of asking students things like Harvard Visible Thinking. If you haven't used it before, I use it all the time myself and have used it in both middle school and high school and even elementary of I used to think and now I think, or doing the typical three, two, one. You know, we're ending our lesson today. What are three things you learned, two things you remember, and one thing you wanna know more about? And then also remembering that in remote teaching, although it shouldn't count, we should do formative low stakes assessments of how are you doing right now? What's going on right now? What's one thing that you want to learn today so that we can keep in our students engaged? And with that, we have, I was trying to talk as fast as I could, um, two minutes left. And so this recording of this session will be posted on that same citizen-u.org website. And you will also have an evaluation emailed to you. The other thing we'll do is we will hang on for a half hour if you would like to talk about anything and you can unmute yourself at any time.